mean, rules are rules are very different now. Like the sparring rules uh, in those days, you had two points for a flying punch, um, and uh, it was one point for a kick to the body, uh, two points for a kick to the head, uh, three points for a jumping kick to the head. Or if you did a jumping kick to the body, it was two points instead of one point. So you'd always add, you'd always add one point if you were jumping. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and then I think what happened was the when when the when the the points rule changed, um, it kind of became more more with more about the hands than about the feet. So there's a lot more punching involved. But saying that, you still got some competitors who can kick from some unbelievable angles and do some incredible things that will literally just come out of nowhere. You know, um, you know, you think of. Uh, Julio Carlos, Timothy Boss, you know, these, these people can kick at such incredible speed and at such incredible angles. Um, so, yeah, I think that the, the rules have really changed the way our competitors fight now. There are some rules that I, that I don't necessarily like, and there's some rules I, don't, I didn't like to enforce as an umpire, but you have to enforce the rules. You know, the, the deduction of a point for grabbing uh, and then what is a grab? You know, when, when they clinch and they come back out again, is that a grab? You know, I, I, I always try to be very consistent with everything because some people, though, if, they, if, if people clinched, the umpire would give a foul to both. Whereas mm. for me, if it's a clinch and they pull away, there's no advantage gained. I, I'd always look, is someone gaining an advantage by this grab? And if someone was gaining an advantage, then I'd Im implement the foul. Um, yeah, and the scoreboards. I've always had an issue with the scoreboards. I don't think the competitors should see the scoreboards. You know, there was something magical in the old days about not knowing the result until the jury president stood up and then went like this, okay? Something magical about that because you just didn't know. Whereas you already know the result before your, hand, your arms lifted. Yeah. I know it can flip I sometimes with the timings because I know that with the electronic system that sometimes it can literally flip in the last second. But uh, maybe, maybe they see that it's like 2-2 two, two or 3-1 or something like that. But to actually see the scores, that's why there are so many complaints because the coach gets upset because they haven't seen a, uh, a score being put on by, by an umpire, but maybe the umpire just didn't see it. Yeah, well, I think definitely from a competitor, I definitely prefer when I spar with the scoreboard. Like, if there's if there's times now where there's a competition and there's no scoreboard, like it does affect like how the, the styles and how you how you like in the match what you do. Like knowing the score is a big thing, but yeah. it's like that. But I think knowing the score is a big thing in nearly all sport. Like, you know, like like. I suppose like in soccer, look, it's easier to keep the score. But if you didn't know, then how would you know to attack or defend? Like, I think it's, I think knowing the score, I think the scoreboards kind of, kind of have to be there to some degree. It's uh, the thing is we, 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 with football, you got, it's 90 minutes. Um, it's a long period of time. Um, and there are different tactics that are involved there, like the, 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 the counter. And I don't know, I, I guess you can find a relation to it in, in Taekwondo. But there was something about, you know, not knowing the result until the end, which meant you had to keep fighting. All you knew were the warnings and the fouls. And so you just had to keep fighting all the way to the end. Um, whereas I think, unfortunately, what's, what's happened with some of, the, some of the fights in the scoreboards, and I, 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 know, I know that there's some competitors that you'll know in the past that did this a lot. The last 15 seconds, we just dance around, walk out the ring, goads the competitor, and it just really made the event look quite bad i think you know it was it was not very sportsmanlike it was not very competitive yeah. that, that's my only thing I, I can see the advantage and i got the advantage because i used the advantage myself as a coach you know where when um when matt cadle was fighting julio carlos in the final of the 2013 world championships you know i could see what's happening so of course i'm, I'm coaching matt based on what i can see on the scoreboard yeah. So he knows he's got to move and just keep him away for the last five seconds because anything can happen with that guy. You know, Julio Carlos can just bring something from nowhere. So, um, yeah, I definitely see the advantage of it. I, I think maybe from a spectator's point of view, maybe, I don't know.
Yeah. I think, I, I think like, like you said before, though, and you could only see the warnings. I don't think people put in or out and how many warnings they got and how that affected the score until you can see it on the scoreboard. When you see that, like, I oh, got nine warnings on and every time that's a point off and with the score is flipping, I think that really makes people think, I better stop stepping out, I better stop falling over, I better stop kicking the back. You know, these kind of, kind of the silly things that you can avoid. Um, yeah. I think that with the scoreboard, you do see the effect of the warnings more. As you said, with the unsportsmanlike stuff and stepping out at the end, like there's some part that says it's it's smart, it's playing the game. But like you said, I don't I don't like like I have done it, um, but I don't like it. And whatever about somebody stepping out, I prefer you'd prefer it to be a bit more discreet than just turning around and just walking out. You know, you see guys that do that. I don't I don't like I said I don't like that. I would like to think. I would like to see a harsher penalty for somebody deciding the last 10 seconds I'm just going to walk out. Um, I think, like you said, it's it's not the most sportsmanlike um, thing to be thing to just avoid and, and give the person no chance of winning or coming back. Or if that's the best tactic you have, then, you know. I mean, that, 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 there is the rule of, of getting a foul if, if in the last 10 seconds you're avoiding sparring. But it's... And yeah, you could say maybe the competitors left it to the last minute, but I can tell you, I've seen some incredible matches. People like Daniel Jawa in the last few seconds, turning a match around Thomas Barada in 2003, he was losing against Russia. And the last round he came out on, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen the fight, but that last round is incredible. The number of headshots that he hit. Um, and it just it just made people fight to the very end. Um, I don't know. I, I, um, I, I you know I see the advantages of it. And as a competitor, the the problem is you got you got juniors. I don't know if you got like juniors who use scoreboards. They spend so much time looking at the scoreboard that they forget to fight, and then they get hit. Or I had a junior once who in one round was red, was blue in the next round, but thought they were red in that round. So I kept thinking, yeah, I'm doing all right. I'm going, what are you doing? <laughs> You know, engage, engage. You've got to get stuck in. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think there can, there can be confusion for color belts, maybe like at a World Cup or something like that. If they're if they're not trained in it and they're not sure, because you have to almost that's almost like a training session in itself, isn't it? You know, learning how to use the scoreboard to your advantage. Yeah, de definitely. I, I remember the first time I would have competed with a scoreboard was it was the World Cup in uh, 2008, and uh, I, I remember I, I was feeling like I was going. I never looked at the score because I didn't really look at the scoreboard. I didn't look at the scoreboard because I hadn't competed with one. So I was just span and I felt like I was winning the way I was moving. And like, I thought, oh, I'm definitely winning here. And then by the end, the referee said, stop. And I looked and I was after losing. And like, and then it was like, oh, that makes sense why Adrian was telling me to attack and not move and all this <laughs> other. But like, again, like it was my first tournament, that kind of big and like everything just goes over your head and you kind of go and go, geez, I thought I was winning. And you know, and uh, I do think that is a big thing. Like you said, with juniors who ha and I think like the same to happen to me, where you think you're winning or you're like, you either don't look at the scoreboard and think you're winning or something and or else you spend too much time looking at the scoreboard and that takes over. But I think with, with our color belts and even like on the, like the color belts in our tournaments, we nearly every ring now we have the, where they have a scoreboard, a TV screen and a scoreboard. So like even like under 10 yellow belts are competing with scoreboards mostly. So, I think, I don't know, we'll have to see it in maybe five, six years' time. That might help if you start them using the scoreboard earlier. Is it something they're just used to by the time they get to, to inter, an international to tournament? You know, I think that... that in it, Ireland, though, you, you've, you've, got, you've got a great setup. You've got, you've got you know, all, all of your rings of, of, uh, of electronic scoreboards. So people yeah. grow up with it. They're used to it. Yeah. You know, most other countries, they don't always have that. Some countries do have it. Some countries are still working just with flags. You know, and clickers. So, um, yeah, it's not everyone yeah. can afford it. Yeah, so, like, yeah. So, I, it's, I'm hoping. I think, and I think it could be an advantage if the scoreboard is something that is going to stay, which I hope it is. Um, it might be something that hopefully we'll see the benefits of coming soon. Because, like, we have had the scoreboards for a long time in the black belt divisions, but down in the color belts and, and starting them, like as kids being able to see the score, and you do see even then they, they struggle with the score. Or, or, they they they're looking and they think, oh, I'm winning, I'm winning, and like they look at the wrong color, like all that stuff. It's better. Maybe those mistakes would be made earlier than at a world of European Championships. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, I think the holding one though, is, yeah, like you said, is an interesting one for the foul because because oftentimes it's very much like even the angle of that the referee is at to the competitors because like sometimes you know it depends on how it looks when the hand comes comes over the back. 
it can look like well that guy was holding but if you saw that from the other side or sometimes you see it like if the, if the, if the camera is at a different angle you're like well why was that warning that wasn't holding because you're seeing it from a different angle but when the referee sees it from there it looks like well that guy was holding a, it's a it can be a very a gray area one you know a very uh, subjective one which guy was holding and it, and it can sometimes just be for a split second exactly and and that, that that's why i always think it's got to be it's got to come down to who's gaining an advantage is there an advantage being gained here um, I remember, uh, when was it now? 2000 and it would have been, I think it was 2002 in the Czech Republic. And it was uh, Daniel Jawa against Zel Galasek. And uh, I think it was 2002. Someone might, yeah, I have to kind of have a think. It's either 2002 or 2003. Anyway, so it was a great first round fight. I mean, they were drawn together in the first round, okay? And it was going to be explosive. Um, and so what happened was um, Daniel had this brilliant tactic. He would score, come in with a punch, because Zelk is just, the, 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 the range on his legs was just incredible in his arms. Um, so Daniel would punch him, grab him, pick up a warning. Punch him, grab him, pick up a warning. So he'd be getting one point every time he moved in, or if it was a flying punch, it would be two points. Then he'd pick up a warning. So he'd always be scoring more points than he was, and then, then when, he, when he got obviously the accumulation of three warnings, he'd be dedu deducted a point. But he was always scoring before he grabbed, and he beat Zog. It was just just the way he did it, because it was the only way that he, well, I guess at that time, I mean, his skill set just went through the roof after that. But um, yeah. Um, so you can see how, how people have used it in the past as an advantage. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, mm -hmm. so it doesn't sound like it was a very exciting match in terms of like as, as a spectacle, you know, like every time. No, as a spectacle, no. But whole, tactically, you know? yeah. when you know these characters, you know, tactically it was, um, you know, it was... I think it was at that time, it was the only way because I think Daniel had just come up from, I think a year earlier, he was minus 63 or something. He was like a lightweight. Yeah, I've seen it just like any time I've looked, I've looked back at the results of that time and you see the minus 63 champion and then like a year later, minus 80, you're going, oh my God, <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> I know. Like to not just so, move up, not, not to, just, just, to just put on that amount, not, not just putting on that amount of weight. But to be mm. winning after put, like after winning after going up to up through the divisions as well is is crazy. Yeah. So I, th I think at that time that that that's how he managed to get around that, and then obviously after that his skill set just changed. And um, yeah, for me Daniel Jawa was an incredible competitor. Just the the, the, the memorable fights uh, of, of him, and and literally winning a fight at the end in the dying seconds with two jump back kicks to the body, literally just, just changing the decision like that. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. I mean, the, the, the guy, the guy's ability. Fantastic. Yeah.